Welcome back to Dorset Shoals Wednesday Night Live. My name is Steve Smith. I'm the pastor here at Dorset Shoals. And you may look around again and say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like uh, the church where you normally film at. Well, I am filming at home as my office is being renovated, so can't really do a lot of work when everyone's hammering and painting and doing all the things around my office. So I'm at home today and figure I would come in as we continue talking about No Sweat Evangelism. And we'll be on our third session, and our third session is going to be Let Them See what you are saying. So today's going to be about an object lesson, which uh, object lessons can be very good tools in which we use to evangelize people who might be more of a visual learner than someone who might be just an auditory learner. And so we can do that. But I do want to do a review over what we've been talking about. The first session of No Sweat Evangelism, we talked about seeing ourselves biblically, that God has a mandate for us to go, and we should not let Satan rob us from that. And how does one of the ways he uses to rob us of that joy that comes from serving God is through the ants, those uh, automatic negative thoughts that come into our mind when we think about evangelism. We need to realize what's the reality of that situation and not fall into those negative thoughts. The second week, we talked about asking four questions. Now, these questions are very simple questions. The who in your life is lost? What are you going to do uh, uh, to reach them, to talk to them? Uh, when will that take place? And where will you talk to them? So simply laying out the practical terms in which you're going to talk to this person, hopefully somebody you know, hopefully somebody you've been talking to and praying for, um, that you're not just going to be going into it blind and not knowing this person at all. But the thing about it is we ask ourselves these questions and it helps to set us up for what we're going to be talking about today. What we're going to be talking about today is using a object lesson and four words. And these four words are accident, apart, approached, and accept. So you'll kind of see exactly what we talk about as we jump right into this. Well, the first thing we want people to know that when we are talking to them about Jesus Christ, when we want them to know that he has a plan for their life, is we want them to know that they are not an accident. You know, one of the things that unfortunately is in our world that Satan uses a very great deal about is people thinking that they are not important or that they are not planned, you know, that they just happen to be here. And this can go forward from just not only from their own, you know, insecurity, but it can also go to what Satan tries to throw at us with science and stuff. It's like, oh, we're just a, you know, an accident that happened. You know, somehow a protein and neutron got together and somehow formed this. And we're just the greatest cosmic accident that ever happened. Well, we are no accident. We need to understand that, that God created us. And so we really want people to see that you are no accident. So one of the things, the object lesson part of this, is what you need to do is try to get three objects. Now, these can be any kind of object. It can be if you have coins in your pocket, um, if you have keys, your cell phone, maybe grab something else. Just three objects that you can use together. And the first thing you're going to do is know that one of the objects is going to be God, and one of the objects is going to represent the person that you're going to talk to. And so the first thing you want them to know is that they are not an accident, that God created them, that they are special, and that they have a purpose. Now, again, you're not trying to just, you know, flower somebody up here, but you are trying to get them to know that God created them, that they are a created being, that this is not a happenstance, this isn't just chance that this happened. Because I think, and this is just my own personal opinion, I think most people look at evolutionary theory where we just happen to evolve and have a hard time with that, of thinking of the complexity of humanity and all the things that would have to happen in order for life to just spontaneously come together on its own. Most people look at that and say, okay, that's a, that's a far reach, versus saying there is an intelligent designer who brought us together, who put us together, and designed this world so that we might survive in it. And when we see that, I think we can help people to see that. Now, the thing you're going to do with the object is, you know, one is God, one represents them, is you want to draw their attention to the space between them. That these two objects, there's a space between these two objects that keeps these two objects from touching. And so, of course, we want to look and say, well, what is that space? What is that space that is keeping these two objects from touching one another? Well, that space is because of sin. You know, if you really want to get down into it, you know, if somebody is very, you know, open to what you're saying, you can talk about, you know, that we used to be connected, that Adam and Eve were connected with God. They walked with God in the Garden of Eden. But when sin entered the picture, what happened? There was a separation that came in. Sin separated us. 
because God is a holy God, can have anything to do with sin, and so we are therefore separated from God. And so sin is what separates us from God. And the thing about it is there's nothing we can do about that. We cannot do anything about sin. Now, one thing that I think is a very important thing to do as well is for them to understand also that is the sins that they commit, but is also the sins of the world. So it's not like, okay, I can try to be good enough. No, we are born in our sin, as the Bible tells us. So there's really no way that we're going to be able to do this on our own, that we've got to make sure that we have outside help when it comes to that, because sin is a part of our world, and sin is real in our world. And so the thing we need to take a look at, the very first thing, again, and I really like to emphasize this, is for them to know that they are no accident. You know, that they are not a, just a happenstance. Humanity itself is not just a happenstance that occurred. But that God created us, but then something came and separated us, and that something is sin. That's why we are all separated from God right now. That sin has separated from us. Okay, so got a couple of questions for you here that might help you get you some thinking about some things. Number one, why does Satan want us to feel like we were an accident or insignificant in this world? It's a great tool that Satan uses. Why does he want us to feel like we are insignificant so much? Okay, and then the last question, in a world of moral relativism, where, you know, all morality is equal, whatever, um, how do we show someone that sin is a real thing? You know, because one group's sin is another group's, you know, righteousness almost. So how do we look and say, you know, sin is real. Sin is a real thing. How do we show them that in this world? Okay? So y'all talk about that for just one moment, and we'll be right back. As we continue talking and using those uh, four words, we used accident in the first one. Now we're going to use the word apart. We are all apart from God. Now again, with the objects, you're looking here and say we're all apart from God. Now the thing you talk about when you're saying, yes, sin is what separates us, and we are all apart from God. You know, we have all messed up. No one in this world is sinless. Uh, you can look to religious leaders. You know, you might say Billy Graham. Uh, you might say the Pope. You know, um, John MacArthur. Any any religious leader that might be out there. Joel Osteen, as much as I don't like to use him. Uh, but the thing is, we know that all of us have sinned. Every single one of us. You can really make it personal. And say I've sinned. You know, yeah. There's nothing special about me. I have sinned too. And so we need to understand that if we cannot. We, we're not going to be righteous. We can't do this. Romans 3.23 in the Bible tells us that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every single person that's ever existed except one, and that is Jesus Christ. We've all sinned. And so you wouldn't want to make that big deal that, hey, you know, the church folks are sinful. The people who live out, you know, a sinful life in the world are sinful. Everybody is sinful. 
And so that puts it out of our hands because if we're all sinful, we can't do it. So we have to have an outside source that says it. But one thing to also point out, though, is that sin has a heavy price. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you almost, we'll put a little emphasis on that wage of sin is death. And we look at it because we all know that every person dies. But when you look at what God is talking about in Romans 6.23, it's not just this idea of physical death, but it's an idea of spiritual death as well, that we die spiritually. And what does spiritual death look like? Spiritual death looks like separation from God and eternity in hell. Now, this is where me and this program kind of differ a little bit here because they don't really talk about hell a lot. We've got to be very honest with the person that there is a hell. There is a heaven there is a hell, and if we do not trust in Jesus Christ, then hell is what awaits us. And the thing is, people are like, oh, we don't scare them into heaven. Well, hell is a scary thing. Separation from God is a scary thing. And so while we shouldn't overemphasize and just try to, to terrify somebody, there's a truth to it. You know, that's almost like saying, oh, that rattlesnake, you can go ahead and play with it. It's okay. You know, I'm not going to scare my child away from the rattlesnake absolutely I'm going to scare my child away from the rattlesnake because they're going to die if they get bit by that rattlesnake. So I don't tell them to play around with it. But, well, that would be don't scare them to be scared of the rattlesnake. Absolutely I'm going to scare them to be scared of the rattlesnake because I want him to be away from it. I don't want anybody to go to hell. So I'm going to tell them the truth, that there is a hell. And the thing we look at it, the wages of sin, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And where we come to that hopelessness, we also look and say, wait a minute, though, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And while that's happening, what you want to do is take that person, the, the objects you got, God the object, and then while you're saying this, while you're talking about the wages of sin is death, all have sinned, you want to kind of take that object away and hide it from view to where it's just there. You know, and the thing about it is do you emphasize at that point, you know, and we can do nothing about this. We cannot be good enough. We cannot go to church enough. We can't be religious enough. We can't do enough good deeds for us and our own power to get back to God. What we have to do is understand that's why Jesus was sent into the world. That's the second part of the verse in 623. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And so that's where we want to go this. So we've seen accident. We have seen, um, excuse me. My, my computer is a little slow right here. We have seen a part that we are all apart from God. And now the next thing we want to see is that God approached us through Jesus Christ. So you're going to take a third object. And what you're going to have to do is take that other one back and say, okay, here is God. We can't get there ourselves. So what do we need? You can put it back. And then you say, we need this third object. And that's how God approached us through Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world and lived a perfect life and died on the cross. And when we say, you know, he lived a perfect life, we have to make sure we stress that, no, Jesus had no sin. You know, people talk about sin. Jesus had no sin. And so what we've got to do is make sure that they know Jesus was a sinless sacrifice because if he had sinned, then he couldn't have died for all mankind. He could have died for his own sins, but he could not die for all mankind. Because he had no sin, he could die for all mankind. And so he died on the cross to save us from our sins. Now, the thing is, why the death on the cross? Why couldn't he have just said, okay, I'm just going to you know, save everybody? Uh, death was the punishment for sin. This was decreed by God that death was going to be punishment. Uh, death was the punishment for sin. Cross, the cross was that punishment. And he took that punishment for us. This would be tantamount to someone like an innocent person going and taking the lethal injection punishment from a killer. And saying, I'll take his punishment even though I'm innocent. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus becomes that bridge between God and us. And he was the only one who could do it. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So it is only through Jesus that we're able to have it. So you have all three of them uh, right in front. That here we are, here God is, and here's Jesus being the bridge for us. So, got a couple of questions before we get to that fourth point. Why does Satan want to downplay the seriousness of sin in our lives? You know, it's not that bad. There's worse. He wants to do that. Why is that? How can we show someone, second question, how can we show someone that Jesus is the correct and only way to heaven? 
And this is for those who have been with me a while. Um, I think there's a very obvious answer here. I hope you get it, okay? What is how do we show that Jesus is the correct and only way to heaven, okay? So y'all talk about that for just one moment, and we'll be right back. So as we get to our fourth um, word that we're going to be looking at, the fourth word we look at is you must accept Jesus by faith. When we look at that, I think the thing you got to emphasize with that person, you got all three signed up, lot, uh, objects lined up in front of them. You talk about what is faith. Now, the one of the things that I use, um, and a lot of it comes from a youth background, is to describe faith is, you know, do they know how to fly an airplane? I use this a lot. You know, it's about the pilot because, you know, most of us don't know how to fly an airplane. If something went wrong when we were riding on an airplane, we wouldn't know what to do, you know, and everything like that. So what are we doing? We're putting our faith in that pilot. That, that pilot knows what they're doing and is going to get us where we need to go. So we sit back and let that pilot take us, let that pilot lead us where he wants us or she wants us to go. And so the same thing is with God, where we look and we say, God, I can't get myself where I need to go. So I'm going to put my faith that you can get me where I need to go. So it's kind of that picture of faith there. Ephesians 2.8 says that this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so this really helps to show that, hey, we can't do it ourselves. It's got to be through God, and it is a gift from God. It is not something we can do ourselves. We put our faith in God, not ourselves, which, of course, is a big thing that we have in our world. People want to put a faith in themselves. that I can do this. I'll do it myself. Instead of, I need to put my faith in Jesus. So what do you do with the three objects? At that point, you connect all three objects, where all three objects are touching. And then you talk about your salvation is through putting your faith in Jesus that gets you where you need to go and gets you to God. And so then what I want you to do, this is kind of the key point, where you take that object that represents them, and you're going to talk to them a little bit here, and you're going to say, looking at this diagram, where you got God and Jesus and where you are, where would you put yourself? Where would you put yourself in my little object lesson here? Uh, there's typically three responses. You know, the first one is people would move their object to touch Jesus so that it makes the three there. Then you ask them and say, okay, well, hey, what's your testimony? How did you come to know Jesus? You know, and talk to them that way. Some might move their object far from Jesus and say, oh, I'm way over here. The question you have is say, does that bother you that you're that far away from Jesus, knowing what we've talked about? You know, and see what their response. And, and, and the thing is, the key here is you're going to have to go with what they say. They may say, no, it doesn't bother me at all. Okay, well, you know, well, I, I gave you the truth. You know, that's it. Some may say, well, it bothers me. Okay, well, what bothers you about it? You know, how can you get closer? Uh, another response is that people put the object close to Jesus, but it does not touch Jesus. Well, the thing you want to ask them there is say, do you understand it being really close um, without touching or really far away from Jesus results in the same thing, eternal separation from God. And so you want to really kind of emphasize that. And then you give them that last question. 
you know, what would keep you from turning from sin and trusting Jesus right now? There's usually three responses that they will give to that. Number one might be outright rejection. Nope, I'm not going to do that. You know, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, the thing is, what you do, you don't push, you don't try to, well, you better do it. You know, you can't do that. But what you understand is that you've done what God has done, and maybe you've planted that seed. Maybe you've planted that seed with that person. Or maybe you've watered. Maybe you've taken that next step for them. But the big thing is you just say, okay, we'll move on. The second thing is they may say, I want more information. You know, well, I, I don't know yet, but I need to know more. Okay, there's a key. Find out any specific questions that you can answer. Say, well, what, what's, what's, what's holding you back? What might you need an answer on? Um, set up a future conversation. Say, well, hey, can we talk next week? You know, go out to you again next week. Let them know that you're going to be praying for them. Yeah, I'll be praying for you about this. Now, the best result, of course, is the third one where they say, hey, yes, I would like to accept. And with that, we'll talk about that next week. So there's your little tease for next week. But I do want you to kind of think about this. Got two more questions for you as we finish up. Number one, what scares people about engaging in this activity where you actually put the things together and ask them that questions? You know, so think about that. What scares people about that? And then how would knowing the who, what, when, and where from session two help to assuage this fear? How can knowing those questions help us not to be so scared about asking these questions? Okay. So y'all talk about that for just one moment, and we'll be right back with our final segment. Well, as you've kind of taken a look and see what we're talking about today when it comes to actually putting the object lesson in front of them, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, and we know this is the toughest part. Because knowing the who, what, where, when, and how, and those things can help us to, okay, I'm not thinking about these other things. I'm not thinking about, you know, well, I've got to get here. I've got to get there. I've got to do this. It helps us to put our mindset right where we need to be. And, of course, the first thing I would say to anybody who's doing this is you need to be praying. You know, this whole process needs to be bathed in prayer where you're sitting there saying, Lord, I want to say what you want me to say. I want to say it when you want me to say it. I want to say, you know, what you're going to say that might push. I'm going to want you to say, you know, what might pull back. And so we have to have the Holy Spirit engaged in this. And that's why I think doing those questions, the who, what, where, when, how, is so important. Because it doesn't come off half-hearted. It doesn't come off off the cuff. Now, I think there's an important thing for us to know these things deeply. Again, that's why the objects are so important that, you know, you can just have a cell phone and a key and, hey, hand me that sugar packet, you know, and you can do it that way. But because it could be, you know, impromptu. It could be someone that you just talk to. But it gives you these tools to be able to talk about. Now, I think the toughest part is when you see people who might reject. And again, I think the, the key to it that we look at is you're doing what God wants you to do. Be, be obedient. And you never know what might happen. Somebody might, you know, reject and say, no, I don't want Jesus. He's, you know, I don't want that. But the key question is, are you going to just give up then? You know, and I hope that's a, a no, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep praying and keep spreading the gospel. Because that's what we are to do. 
So next week we are going to talk about what happens when somebody says, yes, I want to accept. I want Jesus in my life, which of course that's the best part. But we'll talk about that next week. So let's have a word. Dear Father God, Lord, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for you wanting us to be your hands and feet. Lord, because we are so unworthy as we saw it here, Lord, we are sinners. All of us are sinners. But you let, yet, Lord, you saved us. You saved us through your Son. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to go and to answer these questions. Who in our life needs to know the Lord? Where, when, how can we do these things? So, Lord, we might be your servant and take the gospel to them so that they might know what it would take for them to accept Jesus Christ, what it might take for them to come to faith in you. So, Lord, again, give us that strength, give us that courage, Lord, to go forth and to, Lord, understand even if they give a rejection, that they're not rejecting us. They're not rejecting, well, they are rejecting you. But, Lord, maybe it's not a permanent thing. Maybe this is just another step on their journey towards acceptance. But Lord, help us to be obedient students who would do what you tell us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me. Next week, we'll finish up our No Sweat Evangelism lesson. And then we'll have something on the last Wednesday I think is going to be interesting. I think you'll want to check out. But again, thank you for being with us here today. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next week.